But this mother has got to think of her child as being angelic, because if she doesn't have an angelic child, if she has really a demonic child, if she has some really monster of a child, then what is she as a mother? And so for the sake of her own well-being and dignity, she must convince herself that her child is really good. But then, you see, there's mounting evidence that their chi her child is not good. Always in the principal's office, always being disciplined at school, expelled from school. It's always any number of people saw your little Johnny beat up these children and take their lunch money. But she's got to believe, no, they've got it in for Johnny. They are, they're following a vendetta against Johnny. So she takes Johnny out of school and puts him in another school, transfers. She moves to another neighborhood so she doesn't have to hear these stories about Johnny anymore. And she acts like Johnny is an angel. She tells her neighbors what a wonderful child she has. She thinks about him that way. She trusts him around her pocketbook. Any number of other evidences that she wants to believe with all her heart that he's a good kid but the evidence keeps mounting. And now in the new school, she's finding that he's in trouble. He's in the principal's office, being disciplined, being expelled from school. She goes down there and she says, you have it in for Johnny. Everyone tries to counsel her. We don't have it in for Johnny. He's a brat. He's a bully. You're going to have to do something with this kid. No, 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 no. You've probably heard from the other school district. She moves to another neighborhood, puts Johnny in another school. The thing happens again and again. Now, what are we going to say eventually about this poor woman? Does she believe that Johnny is a good kid? No. Her very behavior and the way she deals with the evidence against Johnny shows she doesn't believe he's a good kid. Has she convinced himself, herself that he is a good kid? Yes, she has. That's why there's evidence that she treats him in this way and she promotes him and says he's such an angel when she meets the new neighbors and so forth. Here is a woman who classically knows the truth and has deceived herself about it. Now that is just a little microcosm, a little way of seeing what unbelievers do all the time. They know God in their heart of hearts, and then they go about finding rationalizations to not have to acknowledge it. And the rationalizations may not be as crass as the ones in the story of the lady with the bully child that I've just given you. They may be very sophisticated. They may be rationalizations that come from a person that's a real smooth talker, who has plenty of educational experience, PhDs galore. And he or she can hide their desire to run away from God in a very um, convincing, persuasive way. It's obviously convinced or persuaded them. And yet they could not talk about rationality. They could not talk about science. They could not talk about human dignity and freedom or moral absolutes, given the worldview that they are promoting. And so when they do talk about these things, they are showing that they are self-deceived. They know God in their heart of hearts. That's what you were hearing in that little part of the dialogue with George Smith when I confronted him and said, George, you really do know this God, even though you don't admit it. Thirdly, I hope that you noted in the dialogue with George Smith that he had no reason for being rational. He wrote in his book, he thought he was ridiculing Christians when he said this, by the way, that he didn't want any irrationality, any faith statements. People must be rational, he said, because otherwise it's not conducive to human life. And what I asked him was, George, why should people be rational? And then before he answered, I said, now I know in your book you say because it's conducive to human life. But why should people do that which is conducive to human life? It's kind of like, duh. I've got this end I'm pursuing, but I, I'm not sure why I'm pursuing it. And I said, now given my worldview, it makes sense to tell people to be rational. We have to think God's thoughts after him, and he's consistent and rational. So that's fine. What I don't understand is why on your worldview people have to be rational. Fourthly, the discussion of abstract concepts, which began with George Smith, continued with the telephone callers, one in particular named Max, who got very upset. <laughs> you all know how Max got upset. <laughs> Finally, just, you know, just wanted to end the conversation. There again, and, and I, don't, I, I am concerned, of course, for Max's salvation, so don't take this humor in the wrong way, but what I told you is apologetics it's not my job to change his heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It is my job to close his mouth. And in his case, 
he gave an open demonstration of that when he just wanted to end the conversation. Well, enough of this. And of course, he will say to the people that he talks to and his friends that he ended the conversation because of this stupid Christian over here who couldn't understand things. But you listen to the conversation. It's pretty clear, isn't it, who didn't understand things. Not that he's going to be willing to bite the bullet and say, I didn't have an answer. But I said, you know, where do these laws or concepts come from for you? And he said, well, the human brain does. I said, you don't want to say that. Wait a minute. Because on your worldview, the human brain, which is made up of matter and controlled by biological or chemical or physical laws, deals only with particulars. But concepts are universal. Concepts are immaterial. So that isn't the answer you want to give. And he said, it's just natural, for which now my circle of friends have a joke going, saying, we've been looking for these laws in the natural world. I ask him, where are they growing these concepts? Can we find them in California anywhere? Which was a way of, I hope, not ridiculing him, but using some holy mockery of his worldview. The possibility of abstract concepts um, well, abstract concepts become impossible, is what I want to say, given the atheist worldview. We talked about the uniformity of nature. George Smith said, well, that's just the physical qualities of things, right? It's just the attributes of matter that we see, and that's why we expect the future to be like the past. Last night, I already answered that for you. Well, why are the attributes of matter that we know from the past those which we expect to be true of matter in the future? And then one more thing that you should have picked up on in the tape is when one of the um, Christians who called in confronted George Smith about the origin of life. And I sat there, I wasn't but three feet away from him, and I, I mean, I just looked him in the face and I was appalled at the way he answered this caller. The caller wanted to know what the origin of life is, and he just said, I don't know. That's for the scientists to decide. I'm saying, whoa, wait a minute, George. If you're going to give us a view of the world, if you're going to give us your worldview, talking about the nature of reality and how we know and how we should live our lives, you can't just throw away one of the most difficult questions in the history of philosophy. You can't just throw away what people in all cultures have wanted to know. Where does life come from? And he just wants to say, oh, well, you know, it's up for the scientists to decide. And then he has the audacity to ridicule my Christian brothers for being arbitrary and believing things on faith. Do you see the hypocrisy of that? Well, it's for the scientists to decide. Well, what happens to rationality, George? What happens to your critical mindset, George? Just whatever the scientists say, George, they become your priest? You make fun of Christians for believing what the preacher says just because it's in a book. And you do the very same thing. The difference is you've chosen somebody else to be your priest. Oh, whatever the scientists say. And who knows where life comes from? And I, I hope you picked up on the fact that I pushed the question further. I said, well, this is one of the problems we Christians have with you atheists. You believe the most remarkable things on faith. You have your miracles too. Life comes from non-life. What a remarkable thing to believe. Intelligence comes from non-intelligence. What a remarkable leap of faith. Morality comes from non-morality. How do you do it, George? And here you're making fun of others for having faith. You do an internal critique of the fool's worldview. Answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. But then don't answer the fool according to his folly. You set forth your own worldview as the only one where those things that you're talking about in human experience, laws of logic, the findings of science, the absolutes of morality, the freedom and dignity of human beings, those things that you're talking about make sense within your worldview and don't make any sense within the unbelievers. So this is what we mean by an antithetical or presuppositional approach to defending the faith. Now we need to quickly look at our last illustration, and that's the article that I've written on Bertrand Russell's little piece, Why I Am Not a Christian. 